Good evening. Let's open tonight's service with uh, hymn number 18 in your spiral, Gospel Hymns Hymn Book, number 18. The Bible is a book of Christ. Let's all stand together. word for only one great end, the prophets and apostles to reveal the sinner's friend. The Bible is a book of Christ, it only speaks of him. On every page it shows us Christ, it only speaks of him. The prophecies of old record God's wondrous mighty deeds. Those deeds of power and of grace set forth a woman's seed. The Bible is a book of Christ. It only speaks of him. On every page it shows us Christ. It only speaks of him. The prophets all reveal our Lord as prophet, priest, and king. The types of great redemption show Christ's blood and grace now bring. The Bible is a book of Christ, it only speaks of Him. On every page it shows us Christ, it only speaks of Him. Behold the Lamb, the Baptist said, the sin atoning one, as it was promised long before, God's Son as man has come. The Bible is a book of Christ, it only speaks of Him. On every page it shows us Christ, it only speaks of Him. Our substitute obeyed the law, then died and rose again. And in His word our Savior said, Rejoice, I come again. The Bible is a book of Christ, it only speaks of Him. On every page it shows us Christ, it only speaks of Him. Please be seated. Let's open our Bibles together to Psalm 141, Psalm 141. <clears throat> I know it seems like every time we go to the Psalms, we're reminded of how David is speaking prophetically of Christ. And we just sang that hymn, and certainly that's true here. And uh, as we understand these words in light of that, we see them as our own prayer as well. Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me, and it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, and it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. 
And it seems to me that the last part of verse 5 really kind of goes with verse 6. For yet my prayer also shall be to their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth. And when one cutteth and cleaveth, as if one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are unto thee. O God, the Lord, in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst that I, with all, escape. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the perfection of it. We thank you for the power of it. We thank you, Lord, how your Holy Spirit applies these precious promises and precious truths to our hearts and enables us to look in faith to thy dear Son for all the hope of our salvation. Lord, this is our prayer, that you would put a guard over our lips, pray that you would restrain our steps, pray, Lord, that you would meet with us here this night and that you would speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, for those parts of our body that are afflicted. Lord, that you've afflicted, that are suffering in trials and troubles. We know, Lord, that when you send affliction, that you also send sufficient grace to bear those, those troubles and, and to find hope and safety and escape in Christ. Lord, it's in the name of thy dear son that we come into thy holy presence. Amen. Number 168 in the hardback hymnal, 168. Let's stand together. <coughs> showers of blessing thou art scattering full and free showers the thirsty land refreshing let some drops now fall on me even me even me let thy blessing fall on me pass me not O tender savior let me love and cling to thee i am longing for thy favor whilst thou art calling O call me even me even me let thy blessing fall on thee Pass me not, O mighty Spirit, thou canst make the blind to see. Witnesser of Jesus' merit, speak the word of power to me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Love of God so pure and changeless, blood of Christ so rich and free, grace of God so strong and boundless, magnify them all in me, even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. 
speed not thy lost one bringing. Bind my heart, O Lord, to thee. While the streams of life are springing, blessing others, O oh, bless me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Please be seated. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> We've been looking through the book of Colossians on Sunday mornings and also the book of Ruth. And it seems like on Wednesday night I've um, ended up in one of those two books. As the Lord enables us, I'd like to, I'd like to use our Wednesday night services to go through First and Second Peter uh, over the next however long. So you can read ahead if you like, and um, we'll we'll plan that as long as the Lord enables and gives us uh, messages uh, from from this text. <clears throat> I've titled this message, The Penman, The Providence, and The People of God. Those are simple hooks that we can hang our memory and our thoughts on. Uh, the Penman, The Providence, and The People of God. And... Um, those three points are found in the first two verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. So let's read those two verses together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. God's penman, Peter, introduces himself as a messenger, that's what the word apostle means. Peter, a little stone. Scripture speaks of all believers as being fit together in the household of God as stones, as little building stones, and the Lord Jesus Christ being the foundation stone of the church. And so in that regard, Peter uh, represents all believers, but my encouragement here with Peter, uh, young, impetuous fisherman, uh, Peter, who often in his younger years, we're 30 years now past the crucifixion when Peter writes these epistles. And, uh, and, and yet my encouragement is that if God would take a man like Peter and, uh, and use him to write his word, I mean, what higher calling is there? What, what greater place in the, in the family of God and in the work of salvation is there uh, for any man to hold than to actually be a penman of Scripture? And uh, my encouragement is that if, if the Lord would call a man like Peter to do that, perhaps he would use me to declare what Peter wrote. Perhaps he would use you uh, to believe uh, 
the things that Peter wrote. Uh, <clears throat> Peter is the apostle to the Jews. We remember much about his life during the during the ministry of our Lord and how oftentimes Peter would engage his mouth before his brain and and how uh, uh, we, we, we cannot forget uh, the forsaking of the Lord that, that Peter was uh, guilty of that night of our Lord's um, arrest and subsequent crucifixion. And, uh, and how how far Peter fell in that regard. And yet, here we have him writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the infallible Word of God. <laughs> uh, and when God used a man to write his word, it wasn't as if this man went into some sort of a trance, put a pen in his hand, and... Uh, and the Lord moved his hand as a robot to record these words. God's using the personality of the man. And when we read the things that Peter writes, we can see much of his personality as we can different with Matthew or with Paul or with John. Uh, so here's my point, brethren, that again, God would take a man like Peter. And use him for such a high calling to actually pin for the, for the church um, the inspired word of God. Perhaps there's hope <laughs> that he could use any of us. Um, Peter never forgot his blatant denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. More importantly, he never forgot the mercy and forgiveness that the Lord extended to him for that sin. When you remember the Lord said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Uh, Peter never forgot those things. <clears throat> He's 30 years older now, and now the Lord has him in a place where he can draw from the, from the wisdom that the Lord has revealed to him and, and leave for us a word from God. We know that Scripture is not by private interpretation. These weren't just Peter's thoughts. This wasn't Peter saying, well, it seems to me. Uh, this was a man, a sinner, uh, a man with lots of faults that, uh, that the Lord called out. And uh, Scripture calls him a holy man, a separated man, a man that was set apart by God <laughs> to the writing of God's word. Think about other men that God used to write his word. Think about King David and his moral lapse and sin and fall and and how you know what a what a terrible father David was. And yet and yet God used him. <laughs> you see, I'm encouraged by that. Are you? I'm encouraged that God would take these faulty men and, uh, and use them for such a high calling. Think about Solomon, the son of David, the wisest man that ever lived, and yet 
He made some of the most foolish decisions and choices in his life, particularly towards the end of his life. <laughs> Think about Moses. God had to put Moses through 80 years of the school of hard knocks. God's school of hard knocks. 80 years, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years on the backside of the wilderness tending sheep. Now, Moses is going to be used of God to lead his people and to write his word. <laughs> hey, well, maybe there's some hope for me. James and John, what sweet spirits we hear from these men as they as they record the word of God. And yet, they're called the sons of thunder in the scripture. And they wanted to rain down fire on the Samaritans out of revenge for their for the rejection of, of Christ and of the disciples. <laughs> now, Samson and Gideon and Lot and Noah and all the all the problems that these men had in their lives. And I find some encouragement that God would use men like this. Perhaps, perhaps he'd be pleased to speak to me or even maybe through me. Peter, an apostle, an apostle, a messenger of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was the Lord Jesus Christ that called him out. It was, he, he was an ambassador for Christ, uh, pleading with men uh, to be reconciled to God. And that's what we do. We, we declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are but ambassadors. We're we're, and we're doing this together. You say, well, I'm not an ambassador for Christ. If you're a child of God, you are. You are. And if you're, you're here right now participating in the declaration of the gospel, this is, this is what we're doing. We are, we are declaring the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that he writes this epistle to the strangers. That's what we are in this world. We're, we're strangers. We're foreigners. We're, we're just passing through. They're, they're, we, have a, we have a whole different view of all things than the world has. And that these, these believers are scattered. I started, to, I started to title this message, Scattered Yet Gathered, because the believers are scattered throughout these regions, uh, Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. And yet, clearly, they're gathered together in local assemblies. Uh, in the Lord's providence... He sent a, a persecution against the Jews. Saul of Tarsus was a part of that. After the crucifixion of Christ, the Jews turned on the believers. They were afraid of this sect within Judaism that was a threat to their, to their form of religion. And so they, they attacked the believers. And this wasn't, this wasn't just a, a you know... A, a shunning or a, a slandering uh, like you and I might experience as strangers in this world when we stand for Christ. Uh, these believers had to flee Israel for their lives. They had all their property taken from them and, uh, and they, were, they were scattered. This was 
This was the Lord's providence. This was the Lord's purpose. It was like stamping out a fire and everywhere one of these believing Jews went that the spark would start a new fire. And so we have the gospel being expanded through persecution. I see in this those difficult times of of providence that the Lord sends into your life and into my life. And he always has a purpose. That purpose ultimately is his glory. Everything that he does is for his glory. And everything he does is for our good. And uh, these difficult trials, Paul calls them necessities. Uh, David said, before I was afflicted, I had gone astray. But now, now, Lord, you have drawn me. So these afflictions the Lord uses to draw us to Christ. Uh, these afflictions the Lord uses to get us to see the vanity of this world and to and to not be so tied to these things of this world um, so these are all good things these are good things uh, we know we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and those that are called according to his purpose Peter is the is the apostle to the Jews Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter's writing to these Jews that have been scattered. They've been forced out. They've been threatened with their life. They've had all their property taken from them. They've been displaced. Uh, and, um, and the Lord had his glory and their good purposed in his providence in bringing about this persecution and though they were scattered they were gathered they were gathered in local assemblies um, what a blessing it is to be gathered together in the body of Christ our union with the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't just make our differences insignificant our other differences whatever they might be our union with the Lord Jesus Christ makes whatever other differences that we have irrelevant. Irrelevant. They don't matter. It's the only thing that matters is to be part of the body of Christ. <laughs> and so these, these Jews, as they're being scattered out into the world, are finding their way one to the other as they come together in these different parts of the world to, to worship together and to encourage one another and to love one another and to be a blessing to one another. <laughs> All of these things are happening as a result of what God sent in his good providence, as difficult as that persecution would have been. I mean, scripture tells us in Acts chapter Nine, that the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was breathing out threatenings and going. He had letters from the high priest. He was going out into these different cities and arresting Jews who believed on Christ and bringing them back and having them put to death. I mean, this is, the, this is nothing like the, the, tri, the, the troubles that we might know something about as a result of, of being believers. What a blessing it is that the Lord has, in whatever, in whatever trials he sends our way, given us a need not only for him, but for one another. God's people need one another. They need the encouragement from one another. They, you're, there, there's no temptation taken you. But such as is common to man, that God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. 
but will provide with the temptation the way of escape. (laughs) Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? And we encourage one another to that end, don't we? We say to one another in the midst of our scattered trials and troubles, let's gather together. Let's, Let's look to Christ together. Let's believe on God together. Let's encourage one another. It's a rare thing to find a gospel church. A rare thing. They are few and far between. I was talking to some men uh, last week in Africa. In uh, Malawi, Africa. Two men that are preaching the gospel. And uh, we spent over an hour on the phone together, uh, FaceTime together, and I came away so encouraged. And they were, and they live in a, and they, they are subsistence living. They, they're extremely poor. Um, and they're looking at America uh, thinking, you know, we need your help. We need your encouragement. And, and when I hung up, I thought, No, we need you. (laughs) We need you. We need your faith. We need we need your encouragement. We need your example. Um, But they were saying that in the whole region of Africa where they lived, they didn't know anybody else that believed what they believed, preached what they preached. Here it is. This is um, the penman is none other than Peter. And if Peter could be used as a penman of God, then maybe God would be pleased to, to bless and use us. In the providence of God, they were made to be strangers and scattered throughout all the world, and these trials and troubles. Uh, sent their way. Um, Yet they gathered together in these local assemblies. And I suppose the greatest blessing of the local assembly is the reminder that we have that one day, one day, sooner than we think, we'll be gathered together for all eternity Uh, without this body of sin, without this flesh, uh, without the hindrances of, of this life and this world. We look through a glass darkly now, but then face to face, uh, we have the hope of knowing that what, what John saw when John was given that vision in the book of Revelation and he, and he heard this heavenly choir singing and he said it was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands raising their voices together and praising God and worshiping the Lamb and saying to the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and power. This, gad, this little sample of that that we have now is but a foretaste of the glory divine that we have waiting us. Well, there's there's the gathering together of the saints (laughs) when we're all gathered together in glory in a new body. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. All the elect of God redeemed in Christ and sanctified by the Spirit of God, made perfect and in perfect harmony, where exists nothing but righteousness, no sin, no sorrow. No longer looking through a glass darkly. All to be conformed to the image of Christ in our experience. We have it now in faith. We have it now in our union with Christ. We're conformed to the image of Christ right now. 
before God. That's our only hope of salvation. But to have that experience, <laughs> and we get a little bit of that now. God in his good providence scattered his people throughout these regions, gathered them together in local assemblies, made them able to worship together in hopes of that day of worship that will last for all eternity. That's glorious. <laughs> That's glorious. That's whatever the Lord brings into our lives is to get us to look to that end. people of God are described in verse 2. Let's, let's look at that quickly. And the first thing that the Lord tells us about the people of God, as we saw in verse 1, that we're, that we're strangers in this world. This world is not our home. Uh, we, have, we have a whole different set of values than this world could ever possibly have. We're in Christ, we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. We see things differently. We believe differently. We, we, have, we have a different God than the world has. And in that regard, we're, we're strangers. But in verse two, the Lord tells us something else about his people. And that is that they've been elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now foreknowledge, the word knowledge here, if you think with me all the way back to when Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. This is intimate relationship. That's what the word knowledge means. And so the scripture says that God elected us according to his foreknowledge. So election wasn't the beginning of our salvation. Love was the beginning of our salvation. <laughs> the first cause of our salvation is God placing his love on his people. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And out of that love that I have for you, I have chosen you. I have elected you. Now we are trying to explain these things in order of time, but we know that these things happened in eternity and, and, and one didn't happen before the other. They happened simultaneously and, well, there is no time in eternity. But here's our encouragement. The Father elected a people. <laughs> our hope and our comfort is that God chose us. <laughs> if the Lord waited for us to choose him, we would never be saved. Election is not a closed door to heaven. Election is the only open door that there is to heaven. It's the only open door. If it wasn't for election, there would be no way for anyone to be saved. And any gospel that denies God's sovereign right and, and, and purpose in electing a people according to his own will and purpose is a gospel that makes, that makes man the, the author of his own salvation. Here's our hope, elected by God the Father. According to his own sovereign will and purpose, he chose a particular people. He didn't look down through the quarters of time and choose them according to something that he saw in their lives. He did it for no other reason than for his own glory and purpose in grace. that the praise of the glory of his grace might be known in Christ in electing his people. The 
church of the Lord Jesus Christ has never grown by one single member. Not the eternal church. The eternal church is set in heaven. You know, local assemblies, people come and go. Uh, from one generation to another generation, the, the influence of the gospel and the church may be stronger or weaker in one region of the world. It may differ from one place to the other. But the eternal church, the elect church of God, is exactly the same size now it's ever been and exactly the same size now as it ever will be. <laughs> what hope we have. No, we're not going to change that. Here's my hope. Hey, well, preacher, how do I know that I'm elected? You believe the gospel? You believe on Christ. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're resting all the hopes of your immortal soul on Him. You can't not believe. God has made you to be a believer. That's Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We, we hope for our election. We can't see our election. That's, that's something done eternally in heaven. But what is the evidence of that? It's faith. I do believe on Christ. I do believe that he is the sovereign, successful savior of sinners. And all the hope of my salvation is, is in him. In him. I must be found in him. So here we have, in verse 2, God describes his people in their salvation from the perspective of the election of the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and the redemption of, of God the Son. The triune Godhead. Salvation is of the Lord. God elected a people. God the, Holy, God the Father elected a people. God the Holy Spirit sanctified them, set them apart. God the Son accomplished their redemption. There's the people of God. The children of God. Saved by God. Is there any way that something the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit purposed to do? in making sure that everything necessary for the salvation of their people was, was, was fulfilled? Is there any way that could fail? No. No, that's why, we're, that's why we're so encouraged, because our hope is in God. I, I, God's not looking to me to make any contribution to my salvation. He did it all. He did it in election. He did it in sanctification. He did it in redemption. He'll do it in glorification. And so he tells us that these, these strangers that have been scattered by God's providence, as difficult as that providence was, and we can only imagine. I mean, it, 70 AD, the Romans came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Jews. Many of these Jews were scattered from there. This, this would have been, uh, Peter would have written just a few years before that. So the problems are already brewing in Jerusalem. These are real people in real time suffering uh, dramatically. <laughs> like you and I probably have never really had to suffer. And yet God sent it. God sent it. When, when Paul writes the book of Hebrews, I, I, I believe it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. Perhaps I'm wrong, but Scripture doesn't say. But he reminds us at the end of Hebrews, remember, remember the spoiling of your goods. When you, the book of Hebrews was written to Jews also. The Jewish converts. And, and, and he says, remember the spoiling of your goods. How they... How they took everything from you when you became a believer. And yet here's your encouragement. Here's your hope. God the Father 
according to his foreknowledge. He loved you before anything. Before we knew him, before redemption was accomplished, before anything, he loved you. And uh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Out of love, he elected you. Is there any possible way that God would choose something? You know, we, 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 uh, we, we vote for people and they don't get elected, right? <laughs> Is it possible that God would elect someone and they wouldn't be put in, in office, in place? No. Not only do we have the encouragement of knowing that God the Father elected a particular people, but notice the second part of this verse. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Now, I looked up this word through. It's a little preposition in the original language. It means a fixed position. A fixed position. And so when the Father chose a people, he gave those people to his Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, who set them apart. That's what the word sanctified means. So now the Spirit of God has this, this church, this eternal church, the family of God, chosen by the Father. And now the Holy Spirit is bearing the responsibility to keep them separate from the rest of the world. And to do something for, to make them to differ from the rest of the world. To do something for them that he wouldn't do for anyone else in the world. <laughs> Here's the Holy Spirit has, has God's elect church now in his hands. <laughs> setting them apart, sanctifying them. <clears throat> And purposing to regenerate them at a fixed time. A fixed time. He makes God's elect willing in the day of his power. The Spirit of God is, um, is omnipotent. Just like God the Father and God the Son. He's omnipotent. And when the Spirit of God says breathe, you breathe. <laughs> when the Spirit of God says live, you live. When the Spirit of God says believe, you believe. Yeah. Aren't you glad it's that way? This is what God does for his people. He sanctifies them through or by or in or with. That's prepositions translated with these other words as well. In a fixed position, he sets them apart, makes them to differ. This is the, he, he's, he's, he's going to make them look to Christ. He's going to make them believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to baptize them in the spirit of God. He's going to cause every single one that God chose at a particular point set in time to find themselves to be believers. I'm a believer. <laughs> How'd that happen? The Holy Spirit sanctified you. That's how it happened. The Holy Spirit did it. I love thinking about the way in which the Spirit of God makes God's elect differ from the rest of the world. Believers, we look back at our lives and we think, we, we see... Perhaps you can see, I can see some very near-death experiences before God called me. And, and, you, and you know that there was no way you could have died. Why? Why? Because I've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I've been set apart by the Spirit of God. That, I, my death can't happen until, until the Spirit of God makes me to be a believer.
child of God, you look back at your religious experiences. Fred, you and I were talking about this before, Tricia, before the service, how the Lord, you know, some of our young people thank the Lord. What a blessing it is to grow up under the gospel and to not have to, not have to feed on the, the husk that the swine do eat in false man-made religion. But that being said, a lot of God's people, the Lord took through religion before he brought them to Christ. And child of God, why could you not find satisfaction in that false religion? Why couldn't you find comfort there? Why couldn't you find hope? Your other friends did. Other members of your family, they're just completely happy there. Why were you never satisfied? Why were you always looking for something else? Because you were sanctified, set apart by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was doing a work of grace in you before you knew Christ. It's called grace before grace. It's prevenient grace. It's the work of the Spirit of God. This is the sanctification of the Spirit. All of God's elect, chosen by the Father, according to His foreknowledge... The ones who are scattered throughout the world, the ones who have gathered together in local assemblies, the ones who are strangers, they are sanctified. And they're going to remain set apart for all eternity. God set his people apart in the covenant of grace before Adam was ever made. Why did my path cross the gospel? <laughs> Why was I born into a family where I grew up hearing about Christ and hearing the gospel? Why? Why? I mean, billions of people in the world never heard the gospel. Why did I hear it? Because you were sanctified by the Spirit of God in the covenant of grace before time ever began. <laughs> You see, the Father elected a particular people, gave, if, if, we could, if we could use this analogy, gave them, in a sense, to the Spirit of God, saying, here, you keep them. You keep them. Why is it that one day I found myself believing the gospel? And why is it that I'm still here? Why is it that I'm continuing to believe the gospel? Why haven't I forsaken the gospel? Why haven't you? Because of the sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is not going to fail in what the Father gave him to do. Keep my elect. Keep them. Thirdly, thirdly, this, is, this salvation can't fail. If it, we're chosen by God the Father, elected according to his foreknowledge, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and redeemed through the obedience and bloodshedding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's probably no penman of Scripture that deals with our responsibility to be obedient to God more than Peter. You have a, a few minutes in the next few days, read both the first and second letters of Peter. They're very, they're very short, they're very easy to read. And you'll find that after the first chapter of first Peter, Peter uses the rest of the chapter to remind believers uh, their, their, their life in Christ as a result of what the Lord has done. <laughs> and the second, same thing in 2 Peter. It's almost as if Peter is constantly remembering his own failures and trying to be an encouragement to the church. Um, so, Peter doesn't, P 
Peter doesn't shun reminding us and admonishing us and encouraging us to follow Christ in obedience. He doesn't shun that. But the word here does not refer to our obedience in verse 2 of 1 Peter chapter 2. And it almost seems that it does, but it doesn't. It's talking about the obedience of Christ. (laughs) It's not talking about our obedience. The Spirit of God did not sanctify us unto our obedience by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sanctified us and set us apart unto the obedience and sacrifice of Christ. It's so important. What God's saying to you and me is that you're sal- Yes, God, child of God, you, you want to follow Christ. You want to be obedient to him. And your disobedience is, the Lord's going to chastise you and you're going to have, you hope he does. I hope he does. Um. But your salvation has nothing to do with your obedience. Nothing. (laughs) Has everything to do with his obedience. You see, God doesn't, God requires perfect obedience. With all of our hearts and all of our mind and all of our soul, all of the time, perfect obedience in motive, in thought, in deed, in word, in everything we do. God requires perfect obedience. The Lord Jesus Christ, the only one that did that. He was obedient to the Father, Philippians chapter 3, unto death. Yea, even the death of the cross. He obeyed God right up to the time that he laid down his life for his sheep. And shed his precious blood. So the Lord, before he begins to encourage us. In the believer's life, he's saying, he's saying that our salvation is determined by the obedience and sacrifice of Christ. The doing and dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. The obedience and bloodshedding of the Lord Jesus Christ. The redemption that was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who in Gethsemane sweat great drops of blood and pleaded with the Father, if there be any way this cup can pass from me, Father, let it be nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. Lord, I, I, it was, and at the same time he went back and found the disciples sleeping. Could you not pray with me for one hour? <laughs> can you? And the Lord said, Spirit's willing. Your spirit is willing to be perfectly obedient, but your flesh is weak. Your flesh is weak. And so I'm saying to you that your salvation is not determined by your obedience. It's the obedience of Christ. We come before God looking in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is not our obedience. Our faith is not our contribution to our salvation. It's just the opposite. Faith is is resting all of its hope on another. Faith is not some sort of character trait that makes us you know, bigger and better people, lest you become as a little child, you should not have the kingdom of heaven. Suffer the little children to come unto me. When a, when, a, when a small child is afraid and hides behind its mother's skirt or gets up in the arms of its father and buries its face in the neck of the father, is that to the glory of the child? 
or to the glory of the parent that's protecting and providing for that child. <laughs> and we understand when a small child acts that way. That's natural. But what if an older child acted that way? What if an adult acted? What if you acted that way when you were afraid? Got behind your mother's skirt. Would that not be the most shameful thing for you? And yet, is that not exactly what faith is? You see, faith is not to our glory. It is to our shame. It is to his glory. That's what faith is. Faith is to our shame. It's to our humiliation. It's to our dependence. Faith is all to his glory. <laughs> so we're not coming before God with anything. <laughs> we're coming before God looking in faith to Christ for everything. Notice, I, I have to deal with, we have to deal with the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you remember Peter's writing to Jews. And the Jews knew what the sprinkling of the blood was. You go back to the Old Testament and the priest was to take the blood, was to sprinkle it upon the altar, was to sprinkle it upon Aaron, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. The sprinkling of the blood was part of Old Testament sacrificial worship. And it was constant. And it was a bloody religion. I mean, there were sacrifices made every day. And, and these weren't, uh, these weren't uh, you know, even in, I was thinking even in a slaughterhouse today, there's a, there's a certain control that's used to maintain the spilling out of blood and to keep things, you know, that, that, that's not the way the, the Old Testament sacrifices were. They were violent. They were violent. They were slitting of throats and the spurty. This word sprinkling means to spurt. It means to spill out. The sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was not a controlled uh, environment. It was a violent sacrifice. Scripture says that he was no man. Uh, there was no beauty in him that we should desire him we hid as it were our faces from him it was savage it was violent it was inhumane it was a slaughterhouse the sprinkling of the blood in the old testament what is god saying to me and you your redemption your redemption came at an awful price It wasn't just the, you know, the calm, somehow putting to death. A, no, it was, a, it was a violent death. Never has there been a more cruel form of death than crucifixion. And uh, what's the Lord, what is the Lord saying to me and you about that? Does he just want us to be, to be offended by that? No. He's telling us something about how it is he sees our sin. This is what's required for the putting away of your sin. So here we are, brethren. Poor old Peter. <laughs> and yet, he's being used to actually write the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God. God could use a man like that. You see, God gets all the glory from using a man like that and a man like you and a man like me. And in God's providence, he scattered his children all over the world. He gathers them together in local assemblies where they're able to worship together. He's elected them according to his foreknowledge. He sanctified them by his spirit and he's redeemed them through the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's who we are. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to the hearts of your people. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 23, let's stand together. Number 23.